All right, well, welcome. Glad everyone was able to make it tonight. And so tonight we're going to be doing a uh, sermon slash TED Talk on harmony of the Bible and science. So next slide. So the agenda for tonight, we're going to review the doctrine of dual revelation, creation science models, and the inerrant and inspired word of God, the Bible. Next slide. Why is this discussion on these topics important? So a common question is, does our society have science, a science-faith conflict? So Pew Research done in 2015 says that 73% of folks who never or seldom attend church say yes. 50% for those who attend weekly also say yes, that there is a science-faith conflict. So that obviously is a bit of a problem. Atheist Richard, uh, Richard Dawkins states, I am against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. So what does he mean by that? So unfortunately, there is this common perception that if you embrace Christianity, if you're an evangelical Christian, you believe in an inner and inspired uh, word of God, the Bible, then you're actually giving up a little bit of intellect. Next slide. So what does the Bible say about dual revelation? Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. So what is Romans chapter 1 verse 20 telling us here? So let's break this up. So go back up a couple. So through everything God made, so that tells us right there that God made everything. Universe, earth, creation, creatures. They can see clearly his invisible qualities or attributes. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's all-present. His eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. So anybody can look around, see creatures, the universe, stars, sky. They have no excuse for not wondering if there's a God of the universe, a creator of God. Next slide. So what do Christian creeds say about dual revelation? So the Belgian Confession, which was written around 1555, Article 2 says, We know him, him being God, by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe. And then second, he makes us known to him by his holy and divine word. So what do we mean by the preservation and government of the universe? The government of the universe is basically the laws of the universe. So law of gravity, those types of things. Next slide. Again, God has revealed him, himself in at least two ways. General revelation, which is the record of nature. Special revelation, which is the Bible. Hugh Ross, who is the founder of Reasons to Believe, they're an apologetics think tank that focuses on scient uh, scientists. Where the Bible and nature intersect, they should be free of contradictions. Next slide. So what is this philosophy of the science and faith debate? So I'm going to give you four examples of not really worldviews, but how folks view uh, theology and science. So first is the conflict model. Pits the record of nature versus the Bible. One wins and one loses. For most people, this would something they would be most associated with would be Darwin's theory of evolution, so secular science, what folks are being taught in the public school systems. Separate magisteria states that the nature, states that nature is actual and observable, and the Bible is a book of feelings. May not be as familiar with this one. Separate magisteria, if you are, if you're aware of the intelligent design movement, um, they are a group that believes in separate magisteria. What I mean by separate magisteria is you can pursue science and you can pursue theology and they're two separate efforts. Complementary model, there's a little overlap between the record of nature and the Bible. So if we're thinking about the nature and the, the record of nature and the Bible, so when I say record of nature, we're talking about modern scientific findings. Okay, so if we take modern scientific findings and we try to match that up with what's in the Bible, what you may see is a complementary model looking something like this, or maybe a little like that. A little bit of overlap, but not a ton. 
constructive integration. There's an overlap between the Bible and the record of nature. So a little more than what complementary model looks like. So it'd be more like maybe this. Not completely, but they align. So where the record of nature and the Bible align, they should not contradict. Next slide. So why these different philosophies or worldviews? So the American Association for the Advancement of Science Science is one of the largest and most popular science organizations in the United States. So what they say is science is a process of seeking natural explanations for natural phenomena. So what do you see missing from this statement? So the first, they're not talking about a causal agent. So they're treating science and theology as separate magisteria. But they're also kind of doubling down on this statement. They're not even willing to pursue the possibility of a causal agent, not even saying the God of the Bible, but they're not willing to pursue a causal agent. They're only willing to pursue science and conduct science experiments and try to find solutions if it can be explained through natural explanations or materialism. So if we back this up a second, we kind of talked about some worldviews. We're going to start getting into some science here in a little bit. But this is really not, as we'll see as, as we progress, yes, there's science, um, there's, there's holes in both the science models that I'm going to show you that are kind of their creation models, but there's also, some, there's also holes in the secular science. But it really comes down to more of a philosophical worldview. Next slide. Why these different philosophies or worldviews? So from a Christian worldview, I'm going to walk you through a little later different creation science models. From our perspective, it's how we interpret Genesis. And there are quite a few ways that Christians, theologians, and scientists interpret Genesis. The issue is sensitive to some Christians, especially scientists and theologians. I will walk you through a few creation models with varying interpretations of the Genesis text and the resulting creation models. So first, let's examine whether evolution is a settled science. Next slide. Do any secular scientists disagree with Darwin's theory of evolution? So we talked last week a little bit about descent from Darwin.org. And so this is, this first quote that you're seeing is right on the home page, right up front as soon as you click on the, on the web page. We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Dr. Philip Still, who is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, Emeritus Evan Pugh Professor at Pennsylvania State University, wrote, whatever its other virtues does not provide, or Darwinian evolution, whatever its other virtues, does not provide a fruitful heuristic in experimental biology. Kind of whittle down what heuristic means, Really all it means is, no matter how long we've tried or how much we've tried to experiment to reach a solution, we're not there yet. So no solution for determining origins through Darwinian evolution. So we're going to watch a little bit of video. If you could press this down real quick. You don't even need to press. There, there you go. <laughs> I'm skeptical of the claim. Skeptical. We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutations and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. A careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Skeptical. 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 Skeptical of claims for the ability for the ability of random mutations and natural selection to account for the complexity. Complexity. The complexity. The complexity. To account for the complexity of life. Careful examination. 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 Of the evidence. Full Darwinian theory should be encouraged.
All right, so as you can see, over a thousand scientists with PhDs from all around the world in various, lack of a better term, subjects, concentrations in science. A thousand PhDs that do not agree with Darwin's theory of evolution and being able to explain for the origins of life. And I wish I had enough time to unpack all those arguments and kind of walk you through, uh, but we don't tonight, so hopefully that's something we can do in the future. Next slide. So what did Sir Isaac Newton say? Atheism has no meaning because when I look at the solar system, I see the Earth at an appropriate distance from the sun to receive the appropriate amounts of heat and light. And this did not happen by chance. So Sir Isaac Newton, way back when, so that tells us two things, this statement. So one, he's giving praise to the Creator God, the God of the Bible, but he's also letting us know that even during his time, they had this type of, of battle about who really, where did we come from? So this has been a philosophical slash science question for as long as we've been around, for, for, for centuries. Next slide. So biblical creation science models. And I don't know if any of y'all have heard of any of these, but I'll walk through them. Young Earth creationism. Most folks are a little familiar, at least familiar with young Earth creationism. Um, some organizations that you might have heard of, Answers in Genesis, they are the ones that built like the Noah's Ark in the northern Kentucky, Cincinnati area. So what they believe, Genesis is a literal historical narrative account. So it's actual history. And it's an act, so it acts. It happened or occurred as an instant act of creation. The creation days are six literal 24-hour days, so all of creation was completed within 144 hours. Sin affected the entire earth, not just man, not just humans, but it affected the entire earth. The universe and the earth are six to 10,000 years old. Next is old earth creationism. Old earth creationism, uh, believe that Genesis, again, is a literal historical narrative account, so real history. Creation was progressive and did not happen in an instant. The creation days were a period of time or a revelatory device. The age of the universe, which aligns with modern day science, is 13.88 billion years old, and Earth is 4.55 billion years old. God used both guided and unguided activities in creation. And so we'll, we'll kind of hang out there for a second. So God used both guided and unguided activities. We're not talking about evolution. They do believe in, in creation. So they are not evolutionists. They believe that God created Adam and Eve. But they do believe that God used natural processes to maybe affect some of the other things in, in creation. Next slide. So biblical creation science, theistic or evolutionary creation. creation creationism models. Genesis is interpreted as a poetic narrative, allegory, or as a defense against Near East creation myths. So let's hang out there for a second. So they believe Genesis could be interpreted as or viewed as like maybe some of the Psalms or some of the parables of Jesus. They also believe, and there's different versions out there, and just so you're aware, we're only talking about a few different variations underneath each one. Just see, so there's a ton of different views of the Genesis text. These are just a few of where I would say most Christians, evangelical Christians, land in the science faith landscape. But near creation myths. So there was a lot of creation, near creation myths back in the ancient world. And so a lot of theologians believe that the Genesis text was written actually specifically to the ancient Israelites to correct them, so not to give them a scientific view of how the earth came to be, but to give them more of a view of this is, we're going to worship the God of Israel, one God, as opposed to their, the near ancient um, creation myths having several gods. So creation was a process, vice an instantaneous event, by using God's law of nature to create. Again, they believe the age of the universe is 13.88 billion years old, and the earth is 4.5 billion years old. God used unguided activities and only intervened when necessary. So they believe 
they would they have no problem with Darwin's theory of evolution. Okay, the only thing only problem they have is they do believe that God was a causal agent, even if evolution is how we got here. They believe that God was a causal agent. So I shouldn't say they're okay with Darwinian's theory of evolution. They don't care what the scientific research says because they don't have a literal view of the Genesis text. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, next slide. What are the commonalities between these models? God is a causal agent. All believe that God is involved in his creation, maybe to a different degree, but involved. They all believe in some form of dual revelation. So we had talked a little bit a little bit earlier about those four philosophic worldviews or those philosophic models, views of the model. So evolutionary creation model really fits in the realm of the complementary. So there's a little bit of overlap. Young Earth and young Earth creationism. Depending on the group, you could actually look at separate magisteria. Um, I would say complementary model. So again, just a little bit of overlap. And then old earth creationism, specifically a reason to believe is who I'm using to kind of walk us through the views. They're more of like this. And the reason I say that is a lot of folks will say you can only use the Genesis text when you're looking at creation. Reasons to believe use all 66 books of the Bible because there's a lot of creation verses in Job in Psalms. We'll go through some a little later when I show you a chart, but there are a lot of creation verses throughout the entire 66 books of the Bible. Next slide. So what are some of the theological implications of each model? So young earth creation, their main issue is really that science doesn't align with modern scientific findings. So the age of the universe, they say six to 10,000 years old. Almost all modern science today says that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old and the age of the universe is 13.8 billion years old. During the 1980s, there was several court cases that resulted in young Earth creationism not being allowed to be taught in the public school system. The United States Supreme Court ruled that the court could not find any scientific merit in the young Earth creationist case. Next slide. So implications for old earth creationism, their model aligns with modern science regarding the age of the universe and earth. However, the review that sin did not affect animals and only humans is a contention among some theologians. So do you know what I mean when I say sin did not affect animals and only humans? So the reason why, so they're, in their view, in their model, if you have where the earth has, the earth is 4.5 billion years old. If you look at the days of creation, humans were one of the last that were created. Right? I think humans were created day five, day six. I think it's day six, actually. There's a lot of things that were created before that. What reasons to believe is, is that those animals that were created did not live in harmony. They actually were animals. There was a food chain, there was mass ex a mass extinction event, so this is part of that progressive creation that we're talking about. If you read the text in the Bible, and I don't have time to unpack all of it, but if you read a lot of the creation text, as well as the, the text that talks about basically the doctrine of sin, original sin, it really, my opinion, it reads like it only affected humans. But that's a whole other thing that we'd have to walk through because um, there's just a lot to unpack in the theology. Next slide. So evolutionary creation, uh, creationism, Wayne Grudem, who was a theologian, wrote uh, Systematic Theology in 2020, stated, In sum, the belief in theistic evolution is incompatible with the truthfulness of the Bible and several other doctrines of the Christian faith. However, in the same page... He also states that Francis Schaeffer, in a series of seven statements regarding creation models in the exact text, where bar is not used, there's a possibility of sequence from previously existing things. So in one statement, what Grudem is saying is, 
evolutionary creationism model, if you're looking at it from a theological perspective, the impacts, really doesn't comport with a lot of the creation, what we'll call Christian, major Christian doctrine, evangelical Christian doctrine. What he's also saying, though, is there is some room within the text, the biblical text, that if it doesn't say bara, which means bara is to create out of nothing, so a brand new creation, as long as it's not saying bara in the original Hebrew text, there is some room for things to have been created from natural methods, materialism. Next slide. What do theologians say about the Genesis text? So this is Grudel. As for my own personal view, I can now say that old earth perspective seems more persuasive to me. As for the biblical evidence, I think it can be legitimately and honestly understood that both a young and old earth view <coughs> are compatible and that the Bible does not intend to tell us the age of the earth and or the universe. <coughs> so really what's that saying is if you are looking at scientific facts and you see yourself leaning more towards a young earth creation from a biblical perspective, there's nothing that's really wrong with going in that direction. If you're looking at where you're going to fall in a science faith landscape and you believe that the earth and the universe are should align more with what modern science is saying, that also, according to Grudem, falls in line with the biblical text. <clears throat> Next slide. So biblical inerrancy and inspiration. So what, is the, what does biblical inerrancy mean? Well, the Bible claims to be the word of God. God inspires all scriptures and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Titus chapter 1, verse 2 tells us, This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. So the Bible itself tells us that it is without error and that it is inspired. Next slide. So what does biblical inerrancy mean? Well, the Chicago Statement states the authority of Scripture is a key issue for the Christian church in this and every age. Biblical inerrancy means the Bible is without error. God is without error. God cannot lie, just like we saw in 1 Titus or in Titus chapter 1. God cannot lie. So therefore, the Bible is unable to lie and be with error. Next slide. How do we know the Bible is inspired? Well, the Bible claims it is inspired in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, which we just read about two or three slides ago. And we also have fulfilled prophecy about Jesus and science. Next slide. So this is about Dead Sea Scrolls. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, are you, are you familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls and how they found the scrolls in the Qumran cave? So the Dead Sea Scrolls found in the Qumran cave back in the 40s gave us thousands of, of scrolls and manuscripts. And some of the scrolls that they found are Isaiah chapters 40 through 51. They found them fully intact. Why is this important? Well, before this, I think the oldest Isaiah manuscript we had was from about 1000 AD. These, I believe, are between 50 BC to 450 BC, somewhere in that range. All right, so more than a thousand years older than what we currently what we had previously. What they found when they started looking at these manuscripts versus what they had uh, from 1000 AD. So they looked at the earlier ones versus the the more recent ones. There's really no change. There's no change in meeting. There's no change in any kind of doctrine. The only thing that really changed was like variance. So what do we call variance? So variance in spelling, variance in a location, like a spelling of a location or a person's name. So real no major philosophical or doctrinal issues. So that's that's really important. So what do these tell us? What do these these chapters 40 through 51 as I tell us? Well, they're dated more than 2,700 years ago. They contain the entire book of Isaiah with content that was identical to what they found in many later manuscripts. So it eliminates the issue or the possibility of tampering. But what it told us is what people have only become aware of in the past few centuries 
and science. So one, the history of, of life on Earth progresses from simple to complex. We learned that in all of our science classes. The laws of physics are fixed and applied to the entire universe. And C, the universe is con continuously expanding. So there's verses in Isaiah that tells us all this information about the universe, about the laws and physics, and how the universe is continuously expanding. We only learn about, let's just take the, the uh, universe continuously expanding. We've only learned about that within the past 60 to 70 years. So you're talking about how the Bible was, this was written 2,700 years ago, was talking about what we just currently found in modern science. Therefore, we can look at that as evidence to say, yes, the Bible was indeed inspired and without error. Next slide. So here's some more examples. So the Bible, the earth is a sphere. We just talked about Isaiah 40, chapter 22. So it says in Isaiah chapter 40, 22, the earth is a sphere. What's important to see is what the science at the time was saying. So what he wrote in the Bible actually conflicted with what the science of the time was. The earth was a flat disk. What we know about the earth now is a sphere. Same thing, innumerable stars, which I find this very, very interesting. In Jeremiah 33, chapter 22, they talk about innumerable stars. Back then, the science, they only thought there was an animal. Sick people must be bled. Science now, blood is the source of life and health. And these are just a few of the examples. I wish I had a lot more time to unpack a lot more of these and walk through them. But these are just a few examples. I pulled this from BioLogos, which they are really who I'm talking about when we talk about evolutionary creationism. And we talked about them having just a little bit of overlap. They pulled this off to show the overlap that you can see between science and the Bible. Next slide. So how do we wade through this science fake conflict? Science fake conflict. So one, you got to read and analyze scientific data. If this is something that interests you, if this is you know conflict, I know for me when I was younger, this was a conflict for me. So I used to try to digest as much science as I possibly could. Then I decided, okay, well now I'm going to give the Bible a fair shake. How do I walk through this? Talk to pastors. I looked at websites, and a couple of good ones is Reasons to Believe, Reasons.org, and then Biologos website, Biologos.org. A lot of the information that I talked about in here is right on their website. And they go a lot deeper with stuff. They have books. Um, it's, it, they're really great resources. Before you land in a science faith, let's say a science faith model, you really want to understand what the theological implications are compared to what science is saying. So you want to make sure you have a good understanding of what that is. One thing to remember or to, to know, regardless of where you fall in the science faith landscape, none of this has any impact on salvation. And then the last thing I'll say is test everything. Hold on to the good. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 21. Are there any questions? When you said the universe is expanding, can you, like, what's expanding about the universe? And is, is there a portion of the Bible that you know of that may talk about that? Because I just find that very interesting. Yeah. So that's a great question. So is the universe expanding? So the answer to that is, is yes. So what they've, let's back up. So previously, before Einstein's law uh, or theory of general relativity, most scientists, if you go back to, it's really about, I think Kant was the one that kind of put, uh, put it out there. They believe that the universe was, was static, that it was, it's always been. It, it, there was no point of singularity. It didn't begin. It was always a, it's always been there. So there was no start to it. Einstein's theory of relativity says, no, based on what I'm seeing, based on what I'm able to glean when I do my, my mathematical equation, we actually have a universe that's expanding, but let's remember, Einstein's law of uh, relativity, I think he put that forth in, let's say, the 30s. It wasn't until the 60s, until we had Hubble's telescope, that we were able to actually look and verify that, and how he did this was he was able to see that, like, stars are moving away. 
So what that tells us is if, if things are moving away from us, the universe is expanding. So how do we know? I'll give you a real easy one. Genesis 1.1. God made the heavens and the earth. Right there tells us that there was a beginning of time, space, matter, and energy. That is what we uh, were able to find. That's what scientists has basically confirmed with Big Bang. The Big Bang Theory. Any other questions? All right, well, I appreciate your, your participation and attention. Thanks a lot.